the omega of apostasy. And we are looking at the timeline and a timeline showing every 40 years. Now for tonight, we will be in the third and the fourth generation. Now in our last study, we looked at the evangelical conferences which took place, seeking to change our doctrines with the book Questions on Doctrine. Now from that time period in the 50s, we're gonna look at tonight a key person in Adventist histories who just took those changes to its logical conclusion and did much damage to God's church. And we're looking tonight at the history of Mr. Desmond Ford. Now, from The Gathering Storm and Storm Burst by Russell and Callan Standish, both of these individuals are from Australia as Desmond Ford is also from Australia. So they knew him very well. Uh, Desmond Ford is older than the Standish brothers. Now it's stating here in Gathering Storm and Storm Burst, without dispute, the most able student at the college in 1950 was Desmond Ford, who was that year completing the ministerial course. Not only did Des have an outstanding academic record, but he was also highly spiritual and a speaker of the first order. Yet he was still in his very early 20s. There was no question in our minds that here was a prince of the church in blossom. Furthermore, Des was possessed of a very kindly and helpful personality. It was impossible to dislike him. So his has a wonderful character traits here being spoken of. And he's a highly spiritual and he's a speaker of the first order. So God gave many gifts and talents to Desmond Ford. And this is his starting. And he was completing ministerial training in Australia. Continuing, we were not surprised when following Avondale College affiliation with Pacific Union College, we found that Des had returned to complete his bachelor's degree and had been sponsored to undertake postgraduate studies in the United States. It was at this time that he met Robert Brinsmead, who was studying as an undergraduate in the college. There is no doubt that Brinsmead and Ford spent considerable time in discussions, for each was interested in the other's acute perceptions. Robert Brimsmead, another Australian. So now after Avondale College in Australia, he goes to Pacific Union College and here, continuing his postgraduate studies, he meets Robert Brimsmead. Upon completion of his bachelor's degree, Ford was sponsored to the Theological Seminary where he studied for his master's degree. So it's just more degrees he's advancing up. Here he fell very strongly under the influence of Dr. Edward Heppenstall, whose theological classes he attended. Graduating with his master's degree, he went to the University of Michigan, that's a worldly university, and in a very short time was awarded a PhD in rhetoric. In 1960, he returned to Australia to head the theology department at Avondale College. So notice, he starts in Australia, he goes to America, and while he's in America, master's degree, and here he meets and takes classes from Dr. Edward Heppenstall. So we're going to have to talk about these individuals, Dr. Edward Heppenstall and also Robert Brinsmead as we are going to continue to see what happened with Desmond Ford and what change took place when he went back to Australia. New Theology Advocates In early 1979, the more than two decades of controversy birthed by the release of Questions on Doctrine began to rise to a new level for some time as it had been evident to certain ones that the popular 
evangelical gospel often labeled a new theology with its belief in original sin, the pre-fall humanity of Christ, salvation by justification alone, a finished atonement on Calvary, and the imperfectibility of Christian character, produce inevitable tensions with the sanctuary doctrine as historically taught by Seventh-day Adventists. In the spring of 1979, tensions came at last into the open with the publication of Robert Brimsmead, 1844, Re-Examined. So these are the topics. Now, Robert Brimsmead falls under the new theology, and he had learned that also from his teacher there in Australia, William from Fletcher, and this new theology is continuing on. And here Robert Brimsmead writes, 1844, re-examined. Now, when the book Questions on Doctrine came out, it was printed in 1957, and thousands of copies were mailed free of charge to every religious college and seminary library in the world in the hope that they would be convinced that Adventists were like them in beliefs. Questions on doctrine filled with error spread it throughout the world. So let's talk about that book of Robert Brimsmead. In 1844, re-examined, Brimsmead disputed the biblical foundation of the Adventist sanctuary message in Daniel 8 and 9. Of course, these are the chapters insisted that the book of Hebrews taught the immediate entrance of Christ into the heavenly most holy place at his ascension and sought to dissuade Adventists from resorting to Ellen White for a defense of the church's historic stand on the grounds that, in his view, one such as Ellen White can possess a genuine spiritual gift while at the same time misusing it. That makes no sense. In other words, Brimsmead claimed Ellen White could still be seen as a genuine prophet while presumably being wrong at times in both teaching and lifestyle. So therefore, Ellen White is being disqualified from one of the qualifications of the true prophet in his estimation, Robert Brimsmead. Because when you read books like Early Writings and The Great Controversy, it says exactly the opposite of the error Robert Brimsmead is bringing forth in his book in 1844, Re-Examined. Because, of course, these books and the Bible teaches clearly that Christ went from the holy place into the most holy place. And when he ascended, he did not go into the most holy place. And this is, once again, evangelical doctrines. The theological alignment of Desmond Ford and Robert Brimsmead throughout the 70s has been documented by sympathizers to their cause. Both Ford in his previous position as chairman of the Avondale College Theology Department and Brimsmead as editor of Present Truth, later Verdict Magazine, exerted their influence during this time in the promotion of the aforementioned Evangelical doctrines. Now, these are the doctrines in yellow original sin, the unfallen nature of Christ, righteousness by faith as justification alone, justification as declarative only, and character perfection as an impossibility this side of heaven. Everything you see there in yellow is error and it is Babylonian teachings. And these teachings, Robert Brimsmead, and Desmond Ford, who sat up under and became friends with Bismead, and then Desmond Ford will deal with Heppenstall, these are what they start to advocate. And just as Satan would have it, when Desmond Ford comes back to Australia, he's now a teacher there in Avondale College, and Satan has him spreading doctrines of devils to those young students preparing to, for pastoral ministry. So now let's look at two men, Heppenstall versus Andreasen, M. L. Andreasen. Million Loris Andreasen was born in 1876 and died in 1962. 
Edward Heppenstall was born in 1901 and died in 1994. Both had theological training. Both were born in Europe. Both emigrated to America. Both taught at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Now, this is the important part. Both of these men taught at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, where they had students and individuals up under them to be taught. Now, we know M.L. Andreessen was teaching the historic sanctuary doctrine, and Heppenstall, after him, would teach exactly the opposite. Both were significant writers and speakers, and both address in particular the atonement. These are prominent figures who taught thousands of ministers at the seminary and thousands of members through books and writings. Every religious group has prominent teachers who shape in some measure the thought of the broader church. And all it takes is a single generation to significantly change a teaching. One historic belief, a generation passes off the scene, a new generation comes, and a change can take place. No two individuals had a greater impact on Adventist thought in the last century than these two men. Who? Heppenstall and Andreasen. Andreasen is known especially for his book, The Sanctuary Service, which makes a detailed examination of the Bible teaching on the sanctuary. In particular, his chapter near the end of the book, The Last Generation, has stimulated Jesus-loving Seventh-day Adventists since that book's publication in 1937. The Sanctuary Service by M. L. Andreasen and it has a chapter there dealing with the last generation. But Heppenstall was another highly influential figure who also wrote books, including Our High Priest and The Man Who Was God, in which he addressed many of the same pieces. And that's from Heppenstall versus Andreasen on the Atonement by Pastor Larry Kirk Patrick. Now, what's interesting is when Vance Farrell, who wrote the book Our Evangelical Earthquake, going over questions on doctrine and that history, Vance Farrell, when he was at the seminary, let's see what happened when Vance Farrell was at the seminary. Just as I was graduating, that's Vance Farrell, the decision was made to move the seminary to Berrien Springs. I was now beginning my second year at the seminary. Now look at the years. Those meetings spring 1955 to spring 1956 and the preparation of the General Conference subsidized book Questions on Doctrine, 1956 and 1957, which resulted in something of a doctrinal sellout to the Protestants were primarily held during the time I was attending the seminary. Summer 1955 to summer 1958, next door to where many of the meetings were conducted. Now, this is all God's providence, having Vance Farrell there at this time when all of these things are taking place. God had a work for Vance Farrell to do. As a result of those ongoing meetings, changes in some of the doctrinal teachers teachings at the seminary became noticeable in my second year there. A finished atonement at the cross and diverse positions on the nature of Christ began to be made. Notice that the book comes out 1957. Vance Farrell is in the seminary. And while he's in the seminary, around this time period, they didn't waste no time. And at this time period, Vance Farrell is saying, Changes are being taught to the individuals there at the seminary, which are going in line with the book Questions on Doctrine. A finished atonement at the cross and diverse positions on the nature of Christ began to be made. These men wasted no time. And remember, Heppenstall is there unexplainably. 
I was the only one. Notice that Vance Farrell is the only one who took vigorous exception to the such changes in the classes. I would quote Bible and spirit of prophecy and protest while other students remain silent. Now, this is the sad situation which takes place. God is looking for real men, men who will stand true, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. And other students, I'm sure there with Vance Farrell, would see and hear these errors. But Vance Farrell said, they remained silent. We must speak out when these errors are coming in. They wisely knew that keeping their jobs and or ensuring placement was more important than fussing with teachers about a matter as small as changes in doctrine. That's how they viewed it. But these changes are not small at all. They are major. But sadly, they remain silent. And this is what we see in our church today. Many pastors, many p- members in the church, they know that the pastor is teaching error. They know that the elders are teaching error, not in all churches, but in many churches. But those members, they sit there and they say nothing. If we know it's error, we must bring this to the attention of the people and it must be addressed. This is one of the worst evils against God to remain silent in a religious crisis. But Vance Farrell is there and he's not keeping quiet. I did not make myself a nuisance, yet I did speak up. Amen. Pepin Stoll was especially irritated about this. However, he was an interesting man. It was not until later that I realized he actually liked to see someone in his classes who would stand for something. Pepin Stoll was his major professor and he took more classes under him than any one else. So if Vance Farrell has so many classes with Heppenstall, he knows full well what is being taught because he's hearing it directly from Edward Heppenstall's mouth in class. One day, Heppenstall concluded his class lecture with a quotation from Augustine, the Catholic monk who could not control his passions, yet was sainted by the papacy because he preached absolute submission to the Roman hierarchy. The statement was this, love God and do as you please. What a concept. Taken from the story of my life by Vance Farrell. Now, Bishop of Hippo, Augustine, I gave the background about this man, Bishop of Hippo, Augustine in a message I did, you could look on Cleaver of Truth YouTube channel called The Nature of Sin and Man. And Augustine is the one who really started the doctrine of original sin. Now notice, Heppenstall now, he is giving quotations from Augustine, who is a Catholic. So here we see, as Daniel 11 verse 41, the king of the north entering into the glorious land. Here we see Catholic doctrines coming into the church here at the seminary, being taught by Edward Heppenstall. So sad. Vance Farrell said, years later, I learned that the year after I obtained a Bachelor of Divinity and left the seminary, Desmond Ford arrived from Australia. I was told Heppenstall and Ford did very well together, especially since Ford himself was full of theological half-truths. Once again, the story of my life, Vance Farrell. Look at what's the timing of all these things taking place. Vance Farrell is there. He sees all this and he's able to write our evangelical earthquake to give us, God's people, a true understanding of what took place. And Heppenstall takes over just after M.L. Andreasen, just as Satan would have it. And he's teaching doctrines of devils. And here comes over from Australia, Desmond Ford, and they are having classes. So after all that teaching, up under Edward Heppenstall, and Ford there with Brimsmead, Ford returns to Australia. 
Now we're going to be speaking from the Gathering Storm and Storm Burst, Standish Brothers going over this history. By 1965, men of perception saw, that, saw the direction that Dr. Ford's teaching was taking. Other true believers remained silent because Ford presented his errors with such ease and wove them into the framework of precious truth in such a way that for many, the discernment of error was well nigh impossible. Now, this is why the Bible is telling us we must rightly divide the word of truth. We must be like the Bereans and study to know if someone is teaching us error because there are men out there who can so like the serpent say things truth, but they mix in deadly poisonous error. And Dr. Ford here had a way of speaking very charismatically. The students loved him. And how he spoke, he could easily present error, but mix it in there with the framework of precious truth. And if you're not careful Bible students, you'll be deceived by Ford. It was not on the area of righteousness by faith that these early complaints concerned Ford's doctrine centered. Ford's views of non-victorious living led him to question the sanctuary doctrine for righteousness by faith and the sanctuary are so linked that one cannot hold error in one area without transferring error to the other. So once Desmond Ford is wrong on his understanding of the sanctuary, of course he will be wrong on righteousness by faith. One who to this day remains anonymous and is unknown to us circulated a three-page paper dated September 9, 1965 at Coranborg the village in which Avondale College is situated. So once again, God has someone to stand up for the truth. This person wrote an anonymous three-page letter. Notice the year 1965. And this is what he stated in the letter. Many are becoming concerned at the easy way the old teaching of the age of the earth is being laughed at by the doctor of theology. That is Desmond Ford. So not only was he attacking the sanctuary, he's attacking the age of the earth. Genesis chapter 1. Now in our last study, who was attacking the age of the earth? Barnhouse. Donald Barnhouse. And we see here Desmond Ford doing the same thing. This is the results of question and doctrine and sitting up under false teachers like Helpinstall. Laughed at by the doctor of theology, who says, in effect, the spirit of prophecy may say it is 6,000 years from creation, but I say it could be 7,000 or 8,000 or 9,000 or even 10,000 years ago. It is apparent that this idea originated with the head of the Bible department by the one who loves to speak of Adventist scholarship. Yet a man gets a degree in speech, and then sets himself up as the last word in theology and wants to ride over the writings of inspiration. So this is the slippery slope of Desmond Ford, attacking the sanctuary, attacking creation, and attacking the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White the prophet to God's remnant church. Ford is also attacking the age of the earth as we see it there in Genesis chapter one. And he's teaching these things to the students at Avondale. Dr. Ford would have us believe that the sanctuary in heaven is only an object lesson with no real articles of furniture. In fact, it does not even have walls. In other words, there is no sanctuary in heaven. Do we have an enemy within our ranks who would overthrow the very foundations of this movement? So this person who wrote this anonymous letter had keen discernment, knowing that what Desmond Ford is doing is overthrowing the very foundations of our movement because the foundation central pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist Church 
is the declaration, Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Desmond Ford is fighting the sanctuary doctrine. In Avondale, among the first to express open apprehension of Ford's teachings at Avondale was Pastor George Burnside, the division ministerial secretary. George Burnside. Naturally, he was well acquainted with Dr. Ford since Ford has been, had been an intern on his evangelistic team in 1951. Pastor Burnside was one who had long stood in defense of the scriptural doctrine of the sanctuary. In Pastor Burnside's own homeland, he had seen in the late 1950s the president of the North New Zealand Conference, Pastor Robert Grieve, apostatized on these very points of Adventist understanding. The church had quickly recognized the error and had dismissed, dismissed him from the ministry. Tragically, a number of other promising young workers were lost to God's truth at the same time. So sadly, when error comes in, there are many casualties, and sadly, young workers were lost to God's truth. And here we see by the teachings of Pastor Robert Gree. But notice again, what position did he have? President of the North New Zealand Conference. Now, this is how Satan works. Satan wants to infiltrate the leadership, have them accept error, and with their high position, They'll pass it down, and the deadly error, like a cancer, spreads in the church. Pastor Robert Grieve, North New Zealand, president of the conference. So this is just how Satan would have it. And so it was then, so it is now. Another church leader who I mentioned earlier was Pastor W.W. Fletcher in the late 1920s while teaching at Avondale College also had espoused these views and had been lost to the work of God. He had been a most capable leader and had between 1921 and 1923 been president of the South Asia, notice this, division. President of the South Asia division, preaching error. But he was lost to the cause he was dismissed and Robert Grieve was dismissed. And Satan, still wanting to push this new theology to infect the church, two men who espoused it were dismissed, W.W. Fletcher and Pastor Robert Grieve. So the devil is trying once again, and this time he's going to use Desmond Ford to bring the same error. On more than one occasion, ex-pastor Robert Grieve in writing expressed amazement that Ford was upheld while he had been dismissed for propagating precisely the same doctrines. He's saying, this is not fair. I taught what Desmond is teaching. I was dismissed. He's teaching it. He's not dismissed. Hmm. He demonstrated much greater care than did either Fletcher or Grieve in Australia or Ballinger in the United States in making his views public. Now notice how Desmond Ford works. Indeed, much of the early concern for Dr. Ford's presentation was initiated by the statements of his students who asserted that they had been taught which Adventists, taught that which Adventists could not approve. Yet when Dr. Ford spoke in public, Little, if any, of this error was detectable in his sermons. So he was working clandestinely. When he's preaching in public, he's not bringing out this error. But he's infecting the students in the classroom behind closed doors teaching doctrine of devils. So this is how Desmond Ford was not immediately dismissed because he's working like a serpent here. In 1965, Pastor Burnside was a guest speaker at Victorian Conference camp meeting. 
after preaching on the sanctuary, he was confronted by five ministerial interns. Four of them subsequently left the ministry. Four out of five. Once again, this is what happens with error. Who told him that they could not agree with his presentation. Why would they disagree with Pastor Burnside's presentation who preaches a thus saith the Lord on the topic of the sanctuary? Since Pastor Burnside had presented the Adventist position on the sanctuary, he was perplexed why by their disagreement with his presentation. Questioning them further, he found that each believed that Christ had entered into the second apartment at the time of his ascension. It was discovered that these men asserted that they had been taught this matter by Dr. Ford during his theology classes at Avondale College. So this is what he's doing. He's teaching these ministerial students and then they're not believing the truth, what the Bible says in regards to the sanctuary. So now they say this to Pastor Burnside. Now Pastor Burnside is troubled. Upon his return to the vision headquarters, Pastor Burnside conveyed his discovery to the division leadership, Pastor L.C. Naden, the division president, promptly arranged for a meeting with Dr. Ford. He is perturbed what's happening, and he's calling this meeting. At this meeting, Dr. Ford protested that he could not be judged on the basis of what some of his students said concerning his teaching, and his answers were such that Pastor Naden felt reassured that Ford was standing on the side of truth. Hold on. Pause here. Pastor Burnside, the evangelist, tells him what the students say, and he now just accepts what Desmond Ford says and doesn't investigate the situation. Pastor Burnside, who attended the meeting, felt less assured but nevertheless was not in a position to place his finger upon anything specific since Dr. Ford had denied the teaching of falsehood in this area. Of course he would deny it. What is certain, however, is that following his public expression of concern, Pastor Burnside was relieved of his post as Ministerial Secretary of the Australasian Division at the General Conference Session in Atlantic City in 1970. So we see it once again. The pattern continues. Someone stands up for the right, just as M.L. Andreasen did, just as Al Hudson did. They, they tell their concern to those in leadership and for their fidelity to God, they get dismissed. Pastor Burnside was relieved of his post at ministerial secretary. So we're seeing. These men at the leadership positions are being used by the devil. And the righteous men who stand forth, Satan is working through the leadership to have them cast aside. As it was then, so it is now. It was Ford's series of articles which soon alerted many of the experienced evangelists in the field, men such as pastors J.W. Kent, these are Australian. George Burnside, Australian, and O.K. Anderson. And what's interesting with O.K. Anderson, O.K. Anderson is the brother of Roy Allen Anderson. However, these two brothers are total opposites like Cain and Abel. O.K. Anderson was standing for the right though the heavens fall. And they took concern with what Desmond Ford was doing when Ford started writing articles and they read these articles and they immediately detected that they contain error and these men were deeply concerned. And many of these men were up in age now, and, but they knew what Ford was doing was indeed spreading error there all throughout Australia and something had to be done. Pastor Burnside tried. He's cast aside from his position. 
So to the consternation of many of the concerned brethren. Now, the concerned brethren were a title or a group. These are the same evangelists and pastors who stand up for the truth. They are referred to as the concerned brethren because they are deeply concerned when they heard what Desmond Ford is teaching and writing in Australia. The concerned brethren. The division leadership appeared to throw its authority behind the teachings of the theology department at Avondale under Dr. Ford. Why? Further, the Australasian division had recently contributed a large sum of money, $14,000, towards Dr. Ford's attainment of a second doctorate. So they're funding him to continue on his education, for him to get higher educated in false education to come back and poison Australia. Among the concerned brethren, there was a sentiment that objected to the provision of this money. They believed that it was ill-spent because Dr. Ford had returned with concepts foreign to the Seventh-day Adventist faith, although well accepted within Plymouth Brethrenism. Further, Dr. Ford had been a most popular speaker at camp meetings and many other large meetings within Australasia. So he's a popular preacher, Desmond Ford. People love to come out and to hear Desmond Ford, how he speaks. But he's speaking error. Not only was Dr. Ford a much admired speaker throughout the Australasian division, but now a huge number of his students were pastors preaching in the same vein as he. They sat up under Desmond Ford in the classroom. Now they finished Avondale education. Now they're a pastor. And what are they preaching? What they were taught by Desmond Ford, which is new theology. So it was then, so it is now. People go to Andrews. They think that they can master divinity. They come out under new theology. And what are they teaching in their churches? The same errors that Desmond Ford has been teaching. So this is why we need true education centers that preach a thus saith the Lord, founded on upon the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, not with these th theologians, which many of them are from worldly universities, teaching in accredited Adventist schools. Now, they brought Ford before the Biblical Research Institute. Another meeting is set up. A meeting was arranged for the, for the concerned brethren to present their objections to the teachings at Avondale College to the Biblical Research Institute of the Australasian Division. So this is a big meeting here, the Australasian Division, that the concerned brethren can now voice their concerns to what Desmond Ford is teaching at Avondale. Eventually, 16 brethren presented their concerns to 20 church leaders selected division-wide. The meeting convened at Avondale on this February 3rd, 1976. Only one tape recorded was permitted on the understanding that a copy would be made available to the concerned brethren. But in fact, this was not to be, for the tape was kept subsequently under stringent control at the Australasian Division Headquarters. You see the slope when these men are being used by the devil, they will also lie. So they say that the tape recording would be available, then after the meeting takes place, you're not going to get the tape. And why would they not spread the tape? Because these men of God, the concerned brethren, rebuked Desmond Ford. And because he had not a thus saith the Lord to defend himself, they didn't want others to see that these men of God put Desmond Ford to shame at the meeting. So they want to keep the tape of that. No, only we're going to keep this and keep this locked up. This can't go in the open. These are the type of men working in leadership. They are liars. Desmond Ford before the Biblical Research Institute. Many of the senior men were deeply disturbed 
as they heard long held pillars of our faith rejected. Now, the 16 men there each had different doctrines that they were defending. Russell Standish dealed with creation. He was there as a speaker, one of the 16, Russell Standish. Pastor Kent was also there. Pastor Kent, at last, could stand it no longer. He stood up a few feet from Dr. Ford and clenching the word of God in his outstretched hand exclaimed, I die for the certainties of this book, but I wouldn't shell a corpuscle of my blood for the ifs, buts, and maybes I've heard here today. It was a moment of high drama. The 86-year-old champion for truth had lost none of his lust for the defense of God's message in the heat of the battle. Russell Standish said this meeting was electric and he wished that others could have heard it. But as you, as you well heard just now, the Tate meeting did not see the light of day. A not inconsiderable number of pastors appeared to sympathize with Pastor Kent, who later in the day stood up and expressed the following sentiments. I've spent a lifetime defending of our faith against such ideas as Dr. Ford expressed today. But while I defended our faith on these issues against ministers of various faith, I never believed that the day would ever arrive when I would have to defend them against a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Pastor Kent having to defend the truth against a Seventh-day Adventist ministers. So the sad thing which took place is the conference leaders there, those men who met with the Biblical Research Institute, they sided with Dr. Ford, even though he had no Bible truth to defend his claims. In the same year that that happened, Dr. John Clifford, he was one of the four laymen who was there, and Russell Standish co-authored the first book written exposing the errors of Dr. Ford. Now with the pattern, we have here Russell Standish and the layman by the name of Dr. John Clifford. They wrote this book exposing the errors of Dr. Ford. What do you think will be the results? Well, for this, Russell was stripped of his eldership in the Nuwandig Church in the Victorian Conference. He was ordained an elder at that church, Russell Standish, for writing that book with Dr. John Clifford. That local church there stripped him of his eldership. We see the pattern over and over and over again. In 1976, then termed the Australasian Division, Biblical Research Institute confirmed the alteration in faith in the midst when the members supported Dr. Desmond Ford's New Theology teaching and told a group of 11 faithful pastors in the report, following a discussion approved by the division leadership from February 3rd and 4th of 1976, they stated, the senior ministers as represented by those speakers, concerned brethren, were somewhat unaware of the movements in Adventist thought and the style of doctrinal presentation in recent years, a fact which explains their reaction to some contemporary expositions. So they use all this wordy language just to basically say, in plain English, we accept new theology and too bad for the concerned brethren, we accept this and so it is so. Now, to make matters worse, Desmond Ford is transferred to PUC. Now, once again, we are seeing Desmond Ford is, as a cancer, spreading throughout Australia. Rather than the man in leadership, the men in leadership, quenched it, they side with Ford and they accept new theology. Now, rather than have that error there localized, Satan wants it to spread. So therefore, they're going to transfer Desmond Ford. Where? To America. To Pacific Union College. 
the transfer of Dr. Ford from the chairmanship of the Avondale College Department to the staff of Pacific Union College Theology Department in July 1977 came as a surprise to many, but not to those who had been cognizant of the moves afoot to implement this transfer to the United States. Moves had been underway for the previous two years. Just serpent style, they're planning these things behind closed doors. A number of men in the United States, not fully conversant with Dr. Ford and his talents, believe that if he were sent into, the, into an environment where there were ad, many Adventist theologians, he would be dwarfed by such theologians. In May 1976, Colin approached Pastor Willis Hackett, Vice President of the General Conference. Remember, Colin Standish was also a teacher there in Avondale. He knew exactly what Desmond Ford was doing. He knows about it. He spoke with Desmond Ford in Australia. At this time, the decision to transfer Dr. Ford to Pacific Union College had been taken. Colin expressed the view to Pastor Hackett that a serious mistake had been made. Pastor Hackett indicated the thinking was that in Australia, Dr. Ford was a big fish in a little pool, but that in America, he would be a little fish in a big pool. And Colin Standish says that there is no person who could stand up to Dr. Ford here in America, and he will be a mighty fish in a mighty pool if you send him to America and no one can withstand him because his intellect is higher than theirs is what Colin Standish was warning them. But Satan wanted Desmond here in America to teach to more people. And of course, America over here has a seminary. So Desmond Ford was sent over to PUC. And Colin Standish knew what would take place when he comes over here. There was a scheduled meeting of Association of Adventist Forums with Desmond Ford as the featured speaker. His title, The Investigated Judgment, Theological Milestone, or Historical Necessity. Now, when Colin Standish was in America, when Desmond Ford was over here in America now, Everyone wanted him to speak in different places. Now, Colin Standish was the president over Columbia Union College there, and he refused to let Desmond, Spor Desmond Ford speak at where he was the president. He said, you're not going to infect the students here. But Desmond Ford went to many places teaching these doctrines of devils. But then he had this meeting here. This is a big meeting, and the title is The Investigative Judgment, Theological Milestone, or Historical Necessity. Ford began his discord with his own testimony, describing doubts he held for decades. Notice this, Desmond Ford had doubts for decades, but yet he's still teaching, still teaching about the harmony of the Adventist sanctuary doctrine with the book of Hebrews. He went on to discount the validity of the year-day principle, denied any linguistic connection between Daniel 8.14 and the depiction of Leviticus 16 of the ancient cleansing of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, declared that the book of Hebrews places Christ in the most holy place. Where did we see that? Who else was saying that Christ ascended into the most holy place? Robert Brimsmead. Not in 1844, but immediately at his ascension. And also to promulgate that, that's why he was using the NIV, that horrible wannabe perversion of scriptures there. Desmond Ford now, nearly the whole crowd loved every word, greeting Ford's message with enthusiastic applause. How can the people hear 
doctrines of devils and applauding. At least one retired North American division president was there, rising to his feet during the question period with a choice voice and a breaking heart. Tapes of the meeting belted the world in days. Soon the general conference intervened, arranging with Pacific Union College that Ford be given a six month leave of absence, during which time he would prepare a defense of his views, which would then be examined by a committee of persons from varied backgrounds. Ford's manuscript titled Daniel Late 14, The Day of Atonement and the Investigative Judgment totaled 991 pages and was eventually published in book form. Now, my question is this. If Desmond Ford teaches and is saying all of that error at that meeting and this was spread, these, what he said there, what is the point of even giving him time to further develop this, to share it? Dismiss him, fire the man, teaching error. Oh no, we're going to give him six months leave of absence so he could prepare a defense of his doctrine of devils. So we see once again here, the leaderships not led by the Holy Spirit once again over here in America. A group of 114 scholars, pastors, and church administrators, soon to be called the Sanctuary View Committee, met to consider Ford's case at the Glacier View Ranch near Ward, Colorado, during the week of August 10 to 15, 1980. Less than a month later, following unsuccessful efforts by church leaders to urge Ford's reconsideration of his stand, the General Conference recommended the Australasian Division, now the South Pacific Division, that Ford's ministerial credentials be removed. This was done. So here's a one positive. Because Desmond Ford kept attacking the 2300 days. So that is one thing that they could not agree with. Him attacking the 2300 days and his ministerial credentials were removed. The years that followed would see scores of pastors and a number of congregations exit the ministry as well as the denomination. And the controversy thus ignited continues to this day. That's from the untold story of Glacier View, a response by Kevin Paulson, who was there and heard Desmond Ford's message given there at PUC, and he wrote down what took place. But notice the repercussions of what Desmond Ford has done. The years that followed would see scores of pastors, Adventist pastors, and the members exit the ministry as well as the denomination. So because of Desmond Ford's effect upon God's church, we see scores of pastors leave the truth. And those congregations could have hundreds of members. They also leave the truth because of the error from Desmond Ford. So Desmond Ford had, he sent shockwaves through the church and multitudes lost because of his effect upon Adventism. So even though he lost his credentials there, his error is still being promulgated. New theology spread like a cancer, and because of Desmond Ford's charismatic personality and intellect, many students went on to be pastors to preach doctrines of devils to their congregations, and the last generation theology, which was taught by Emil Andreasen, is vehemently opposed by many conferences and leaders. And men like Dennis Preeby, even some churches don't want him to be invited to preach there because he preaches the nature of Christ and victory over sin. Many conferences and many pastors don't want to hear that because they're new theology. And no, 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 he can't speak in our church. So it was then, it is continuing. 
there is still a fight against the doctrine of victory over sin, righteousness by faith, the nature of Christ, nature of man, nature of sin. So we have to this day modern Fordites. Desmond Fordites. After Ford was dismissed from the denomination employment in 1980, a staggering 180 ministers left the ministry within the next decade to show how many of these ministers did not know the full truth that what Desmond Ford was teaching, they went astray with that error. They themselves were not rooted and grounded in the truth that Desmond Ford's error caused them also to leave Adventism. 180 ministers left the ministry within the next decade. However, most of his followers and sympathizers remained in the church. He, who is he? Desmond Ford urged them to do this so that they could use their influence more effectively to change the church. So even though Desmond Ford has passed away, we have the Fordites on the scene. And these individuals going up the ranks, pastors, getting up to high levels in conference, Satan now is using these individuals to change the church. Many have since employed positions of trust and responsibility. Head of leadership. So new theology spread like a cancer. And because of Desmond Ford, it's spreading over and over throughout the church. The effects from questions on doctrine, the effects not only of Desmond Ford, but of all the students who sat up under Edward Heppenstall, who was over the theology department. Back to the statement in the Omega. The enemy of souls, Satan, has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. So these modern-day Fordites, who Desmond Ford said stay in the church and change the church, this is what's taking place, and individuals are giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith, and the pillar of our faith is the law of God, the sanctuary, victory over sin, health message, all of these pillars, and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would be the result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. Principles of truth discarded. Our religion would be changed. Giving up the doctrines. Which doctrines? Well, the doctrines brought in by Edward Heppenstall and Desmond Ford. Which doctrines? are being changed in Adventism now. The nature of Christ, righteousness by faith, investigative judgment, character perfection, sanctification, because what's being taught now is justification, declarative alone, not justification, being made righteous as it says in the scriptures and also in thoughts from Ronald Blason. No, we are preaching justification is only a legal declarative forensic justification. No made righteous, only declarative, and sanctification. No, no, no. That's not necessary. We don't need to worry about sanctification. Where is this reorganization which is taking place? In this process of reorganization, the reorganization is taking place in the seminaries where those who go in there to be pastors are taught the new theology to spread it to the churches. So this new religion, which has come into Adventism, mimics Babylon in regards to that the standards which stands up for the pillars of our faith 
are being discarded. Stating that you can't have character perfection. You can't live a perfect life in Christ. No, 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 no. You just need this forensic justification like an umbrella that is always with you. Error. She says the fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be as counted as error. Cleansing of the sanctuary, error for the new theology preachers. The day year principle, error. Spirit of prophecy as authoritative in the church. No, 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 no. Only when she says, I was shown. No, no, no. Not everything she said is inspired. Some things was just for her time. And all of this lies is to fight against the spirit of prophecy's authoritative position in the church because what she writes goes against the new theology. So therefore, they need to demote Ellen White. Says our religion would be changed. Reverence in God's church, error. Male elders, error. Only pastors to be male? No, that's error. We want women pastors. We want women elders. Reverence in the church? What took place in June 7th to June 10 in the Southwest Region Conference? We saw devil worship and the music leader thank Carlton Bird for the invite. Who is Carlton Bird? He is the president of the Southwest Region Conference, and he loved all of that. And this is nothing new with Carlton Bird. He's been inviting non-Adventist singers to sing in Advent to, to Adventists time and time again, wanting C.C. Winans and all these worldly singers, Babylonians, come in to Adventism. This is what is taking place. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years will be counted as error. You're saying this type of worship, this is satanic demons are there? No, no, no. You're in error. We're praising God, so they would say. Now, Ellen White wrote in Review and Herald, May 25, 1905, she says, in the future, deception of every kind is to arise. Every kind. And we want solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. She says, not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. The enemy will bring in false theories. What false theory will the enemy bring in? Such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. She knew, God told her that this would take place. The enemy, Satan, will bring in false theories, such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. Brought in primarily Desmond Ford. This, she says, is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Departing from the faith. Desmond Ford comes in, 180 ministers left the ministry within that decade, and their members also left the church as well. She saw it. God showed her this is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Desmond Ford and the results from him. Where shall we find safety unless it is to be in the truths that the Lord has been giving for the last 50 years? The Omega of Apostasy. Then she says, Books of New Order would be written. And in the last study I spoke about, one of the books is Question on Doctrine. Let's look at some of these other books of a new order that would be written. Abominations. Look at this slide here. We see two books, Steps to Christ, the most translated book written by Ellen G. White, the book which teaches righteousness by faith. Beside that book, you see here, Steps to Jesus. But we see at the bottom also Ellen G. White. But we're going to learn that that book on the right, Steps to Jesus, is not written by Ellen G. White. 
Now the Bible says in Revelation 22, verse 18 to 19, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, that if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God does not play when people alter the word of God. And that has been done time and time again, just as Satan would have it, with all these perversions of translations of the scriptures. Individuals are taking things out, changing a thus saith the Lord to deceive mankind. God will judge those people who make all these versions, NRSV, NASB, NIV, and all these corruptions. God will judge them. But God will also judge these individuals who come up with this steps to Jesus book. Now, I'm going to read to you from Steps of Christ, the book on the left. This is Ellen G. White. Steps of Christ, page 62. It says, it was possible for Adam before the fall, before he sinned, to form a righteous character by obedience to the law of God. Because the law of God was in his heart, God made Adam perfect, holy, righteous. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Adam sinned. Adam had children, and we all are now born with a fallen nature. Since we are sinful, unholy, and we, we cannot perfectly obey the law of God, we have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in the place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. That is justification. Beautiful statement there, inspired by God. But I want us to notice the red. It says, but he failed to do this. And because of his sin, because of his sin, our natures are fallen and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Now, in steps to Jesus, the trustees of the LNG White Estate, they decided we're going to rewrite steps to Christ. Now, look how they rewrote that section from Steps to Christ, which we, I just read here on page 62. This is from Steps to Jesus. This is not Ellen White. This is the trustees rewriting. This is what it says. It was possible for Adam before he sinned to form a righteous character by obeying God's law. But Adam failed to do this. Because of his sin, we are all sinners and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Because we are sinful and unholy, we cannot perfectly obey God's law. We have no righteousness of our own to do what God's laws require. They absolutely change what the spirit of prophecy stated and they are teaching here original sin. Notice the prophet of God, but he failed to do this. And because of his sin, Adam, our natures are fallen and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Ellen White mentions our natures are fallen. Books of a New Order says, but Adam failed to do this because of his sin. We are all sinners and we cannot make ourselves holy. Original sin. They're saying that because of Adam's sin. We are all sinners. That is not what the prophet wrote. So notice, just as the nature of Christ is attacked in new theology, 
so is the nature of man attacked in new theology. And in these books of a new orders, these individuals, the trustees of the white estate who rewrote the prophet's words, they changed it to teach original sin, which is Catholic doctrine coming from the streams of Augustine, Catholic monk, Bishop of Hippo. This is teaching original sin. Now the Bible says, Ezekiel 18 verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 18 20 says, no one can get sin passed down to them. Sin is not passed down. Sin is a choice. You choose to follow God or you choose to disobey God. Sin, 1 John 3, 4, is the transgression of God's law. So what is this book of a new order teaching? This book of a new order is teaching because Adam sinned, we are all sinners. So therefore, they're teaching that sin is nature. So therefore, we'll always be sinning as soon as you're breathing every second of every day from the baby just comes out the mother's womb. The baby is sinning because the baby is breathing, because the baby is alive, and because sin is nature, you are always sinning. So this is why their justification is an umbrella, because how can you get victory over sin if sin is nature? So the books of the new order is teaching the new theology so that individuals who read these books are infected with lies and it goes all around the world. So this here really is abomination and it should make everyone furious to realize that these men or women, whoever it was, who are so brazen, so bold, have so much gall and so out of their place to think that they can change the prophet's words. Who do these people think they are? Ellen White wrote, letter 92, 1900, the Holy Ghost is the author of the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. So what we read in Steps to Christ is the author of that is the Holy Ghost is the author of the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. She says, these are not to be twisted and turned to mean what men want them to mean, to carry out man's ideas and sentiments, to carry forward man's schemes and hazards. Tell me if Ellen White was not a prophet of God. She wrote this, letter 92, 1900s, we see fulfillment in the Omega, the books of a new order, not only Steps of Christ, they've done this to the whole conflict series. They've done this to Ministry of Healing. They've done this to many of her books, rewriting them. And here it says, letter 92, 1900s, she says, her writings, these are not to be twisted as they did right here. They are not to be turned to mean what men want them to mean. They did it right here, Books of a New Order, to carry out man's ideas and schemes, fulfillment, to carry forward men's schemes at all hazards, books of a new order. So this is where we are in Earth's history. When it's talking about books of a new order, it's not only these books that teach that you can't get victory over sin and books coming in teaching blatant error. The books of the new order are the white estates rewriting in what they say modern English because it's so hard to read Steps of Christ now. We need it rewritten. So these men are thinking in their warped mind that they are wiser than the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost couldn't write Steps of Christ so that everyone can understand it. So these men or women had to come on the scenes to change the prophet's words with the books of the new order. And you see what they teach? Original sin. Books of a New Order. Now look at what they say. They said in the introduction, Steps to Jesus is an adaptation of Ellen G. White's most popular book, Steps to Christ. This adaptation enables the book's uplifting message to read a wider audience. 
particularly the youth. Oh, because the youth are so dumb that they can't understand steps of Christ. They need to adapt it for the youth. It retains the author's thoughts. No, lies. This was not the author's thought. Ellen White did not say original sin. This is not the author's thoughts. So here we see they're lying. It retains the author's thoughts, but restates 19th century expressions in today's language, simplifies the vocabulary, shortens long sentences. Oh, how can we read long sentences? We're so dumb. It's too hard. We need short sentences. Following carefully established guidelines, with only a few exceptions, scripture passages from the today's English version of the Bible have replaced text from the King James Version. Of course, we don't want the people to read the actual word of God, the King James Version, the received text. No, 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 no. We want them to read the perverted text of the scriptures. So we'll give them the today's English Version, Bible text credited to RSV, are from the Revised Standard Version, passages marked TLB are taken from the Living Bible, Although this adaptation of Steps to Christ is now available, the original book remains the standard work. It is our prayer that Steps to Jesus will bring a blessing to readers throughout the world. A blessing? New theology. May its message lead many to accept Jesus and to follow him always as Lord and Savior. How can they do that when errors in there? Who wrote that? The trustees of the Ellen G. White estate. This is what is taking place in the Omega. Ellen White is in her grave, awaiting resurrection morning. But the Ellen G. White estate has been infiltrated. And we wonder why, when many say that there's Jesuits within the camp, that these are truly Catholics are within us. Because of things like this taking place, no true Adventist who believes in the spirit of prophecy would be that bold to think that they can change God's word. You are smarter than the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, we are in the Omega, and in the next message, we're going to go into the fifth generation. And if you think what we saw today in this message is bad, it's only going to get worse in the fifth generation. Satan is going crazy in generation number five. Brothers and sisters, get ready, get ready, get ready. We looked at generation four, and we're going to go to generation five. Do not miss generation five as we continue the Omega of Apostasy series. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are truly living in the last days. Men have altered inspired writings and trustees of the white estate. Lord, I pray that they would repent. I pray that these books will be taken away from the LNG White app, it's taken from the website of the Ellen White website, Lord, Men have been deceived by devils or their Catholics or their Jesuits. Lord, we have been infiltrated. And I pray that men will repent before it's too late. You said in, your, in Ellen White's writings that pastors will suffer 10 times worse than the lake of fire. How much more individuals who change inspired writings. Lord, I pray that they would repent. I pray that your people will be awakened as we're in the Omega of Apostasy to study their Bibles as they never studied it before and read the spirit of prophecy to be prepared for what is coming upon this earth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.